Welcome back into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. We are now part two of our deep dive into undercover work into the mafia, uh, a masterclass offered to us by Herman Grohman. Herm, thanks for joining me again. Sure. Yep. Happy to be here. Uh, right now, we're going to talk about how Herm almost single-handedly sledgehammered the L.A. Mafia to death uh, with his undercover well, let me operation. Stop you. That's, not, that's not quite true. Uh, you know, no. uh, it's a little hyperbolic. It. It's a little hyperbolic. But the, the point is that by the time Herm's operation came to an end, uh, they had solved the Herbie Blitzstein murder. Uh, from the movie Casino, and the what, what was once a pretty formidable organized crime group in L.A. was really a, on its final legs. Um, so if Herm didn't kill it, he uh, he helped put him on the ropes where, where someone else could land the land along, the, the death. Along with somebody, but Charlie Maurer. Uh, right. Uh, uh, so just to, you know, tell us about your undercover work in L.A. I believe it started what in '96. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, as we've uh, established before, <clears throat> you know, I had a lot of uh, undercover experience, uh, both going back in the 1970s in Cleveland and uh, uh, some limited uh, undercover work in uh, Detroit as well. And, uh, you know, my first office um, of assignment in the FBI was uh, Pittsburgh. And um, <clears throat> we... Uh, we got a new uh, assistant special agent in charge by the name of uh, Tony Daniels. And I was a brand new agent, this is 1980. I'd just gotten out of the academy a few months earlier. And uh, Tony was a very, very dynamic guy uh, and just a, a great leader. And uh, uh, because of my background, uh, working undercover with the state and so forth, I sort of migrated in that uh, direction. And again, back in the, you know, the early 1980s, uh, 1979, 1980, the Bureau was uh, really not involved in undercover operations. Uh, uh, this was all new territory for the Bureau. And, uh, and uh, I had uh, infiltrated and uh, set up a uh, major undercover operation out of the Pittsburgh operation, uh, Pittsburgh uh, field office in West Virginia, where we uh, ended up opening up a small casino and uh, we had the sheriff on the uh, pay, on the payroll to protect it. And uh, so, <clears throat> so uh, Tony Daniels came to me one day and I'm just a young guy. I mean, I've got uh, three months in the bureau at this point. And um, he said, uh, hey, listen, an operation ongoing uh, down in Florida. Uh, these undercover agents have been at it uh, for about five years now, and uh, they know what they're doing. And what I'd like you to do, because you can learn from these guys, I want you to go down and uh, just hang out with them and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, pick their brains. And I said, yeah, okay, great. So I go to Florida, and um, I go into this, um, they had a uh, outside of Clearwater, Florida, they had a uh, 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 kind of a little club, and it was a, like a private tennis club. And inside, they had uh, some gambling operations and so forth. And so I met a guy by the name of Joe Pistone, and um, who um, uh, and talked with him and uh, and uh, got a few pointers. And Donnie uh, Brasco. For people that might not know, that's Donnie Brasco. It ended up uh, his under. Cover name was Donnie Brasco, so uh, so I cut my uh, I you know I I earned my bones uh, from some a good guy, and uh, we've remained uh, friends ever since. I talked to him uh, not too long ago. In fact, it was kind of funny. I was with uh, an old buddy of mine that uh, was a foxhole buddy from Vietnam, and uh, we uh, were touring the Mob Museum in uh, in uh, here in Las Vegas. Las Vegas and I think, yeah, I'm I think on the board. Yeah, I'm on the board. Yeah, you're on the board. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, I've made a couple of presentations down there and so yep. forth. So I'm going through with uh, my friend and we come to this display of um, uh, Donnie Brasco, uh, Joe Pistone. And he's looking at it and he's asking me questions. So I got Joe Pistone's number in my cell phone. I said, uh, hold on just a second. I said, Joe, this guy's uh, got some questions for you. you want <laughs> so it was great. It was great. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have to buy dinner that night. So. <laughs> It was good. But uh, so anyway, I had a background in undercover stuff and uh, kind of uh, gravitated uh, toward that. And uh, eventually I ended up in uh, 1993 
<clears throat> in uh, Las Vegas from the Detroit FBI office. And initially I got involved in uh, uh, working some public corruption cases and so forth. And uh, uh, simultaneously uh, at about the same time, or maybe a year or two later, uh, uh, the uh, Milano crime family uh, was trying to get established in Las Vegas. And uh, uh, their front man or their un the underboss of the Milano crime family, who interestingly has uh, roots in Cleveland, uh, was right, Carmen. Dad, his dad, right, his dad, uh, Carmen Milano's dad was Tony Milano, who was a conciliary of the Cleveland Mafia for a long time. Pete That's Milano right. and Carmen Milano went out to uh, L.A. in the 60s, uh, got made, and then by the early 80s, they had become boss and underboss. Herm comes into the picture when Pete sends Carmen out to Vegas to try to uh, build a crew there. Right. And, uh, you know, Las Vegas is tough, you know, especially after uh, Tony Splatro and uh, the Chicago outfit, uh, you know, and Detroit uh, and others uh, tried to make uh, their inroads in Las Vegas back in the 1980s. And, uh, you know, it's tough, you know, for the mob to break into um, the casino business like they did. There's all kinds of rules. They have the black book and all kinds of restrictions. Uh, but um, uh, nevertheless, uh, I think uh, Carmen Milano's, um, I think his uh, uh, mission was to just get established, put together a small crew, uh, walk delicately and see where it goes. <clears throat> and so, uh, so I ended up, uh, uh, being introduced to an informant uh, who uh, was an associate of the uh, Gambino crime family in New York. And everybody's got a fat Tony. This guy was fat right. Tony. And, <laughs> but he was really fat. He was about <laughs> 500 pounds, you know. And I'll never forget the uh, first time I met him, it was on Boulder Highway, uh, just outside of Las Vegas. And my undercover vehicle was a small uh, Jaguar Roadster. And um, so I go to pick this guy up and I'm looking at him and think, no way is this guy going to fit my car. <laughs> so it was very New York. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And he's one of these guys. And I, he said, I'm supposed to ride in that toy? I said, well, Tony, it's the only car I got, man. So we had to put the top down. Uh, it was like March, you know, it was old. And uh, we're going down Boulder Highway. And I'll never forget the car is going like this down the highway. And the cops uh, see like there's something wrong, uh, so they investigate and pull us over. So that was Fat Tony, and Fat Tony uh, was um, he was the best informant I ever worked with, and he was the worst informant I ever worked with. He was very very high maintenance. Uh, he would go off on these tangents, uh, but when he was on target, he was on target. And so we set up a um, uh, a uh, it was kind of a what you would see on The Sopranos, a little butta bing club. Uh, you know, a lot of these outfits want to have a little club, you know, where they can all kind of get together. Well, through Tony, uh, we set up a place and we called it Sea Breeze. And uh, um, it was uh, located just off the strip in an industrial area. And um, so Tony set this up. We had it all wired with uh, uh, microphones and cameras and so forth. And uh, through Tony, Tony's connections, he was able to eventually get Carmen Milano uh, through Tony's connections in L.A. to come into the club, essentially set up residency, bring his crew in and set up his operation right there. So it was perfect. And uh, so my role was I uh, was a big time drug dealer. This is my undercover role. And uh, my name was Sonny, Sonny Blake. And, uh, uh, you know, I always used to, like to use kind of a nickname for the first name because nobody really knows your first name. If they're going to do some due diligence, they say, what's the guy's real name? Well, I don't know. Sonny. So <clears throat> I always use the name Sonny. And uh, my undercover role, I was uh, a uh, former big time drug dealer, uh, a wholesaler, and I accumulated a lot of money. Uh, from the behind the scenes in uh, Detroit. <clears throat> and I was going through a divorce 
and I pulled up stakes and I went to Las Vegas and I had uh, a lot of money in uh, hidden businesses uh, like the auto emissions testing business. And so I had these shops and uh, coincidentally, I had, uh, an informant um, who ended up actually being a good friend of mine and uh, who owned many of these shops. And he allowed me to portray myself as like a hidden owner in the shops. And so it gave me credibility. You know, if somebody called, uh, you know, the uh, his main office and talked to him, yeah, hey, Sonny's not here right now, but he'll be back later. What do you want? So it was great. So, um, so with that in mind, uh, I began, I was introduced uh, to, uh, the first time I met Carmen Milano uh, was uh, really interesting. I had a little offsite location uh, where I was supposed to be operating my <clears throat> little business. And it wasn't far from Seabreeze. And um, uh, again, it was all wired up with uh, videotape and so forth. And one of the objectives of me working undercover at that point was to uh, the um, Teamsters, no, not surprisingly, uh, were involved in um, ripping off some of these big high-end uh, convention uh, operations. When they would tear down the convention, if it was an electronics or uh, uh, men's apparel <clears throat> or whatever, uh, there would be truckloads of stuff that would just disappear. And the Teamsters were involved in that. And uh, so through uh, an informant, I hooked up with one of the Teamsters who had some juice and uh, uh, was able to uh, buy a truckload, a semi-truck load uh, full of um, clothing <laughs> from a convention. I had every kind of shirt that you can imagine. I had leather shirts. I had silk shirts. I had everything you could possibly imagine. And this little uh, uh, office that I had, I had a warehouse attached to it. And so I <clears throat> had all the clothing delivered to this warehouse, and we put it in there, and I paid off the guys. So I get a call uh, from a guy by the name of Pete Caruso, who was an associate of Carmen Milano's. And he was a real true gangster. I mean, he was a bad guy. He came from um, uh, New York and uh, done time in Sing Sing. And uh, he was he was a bad guy. And he's uh, a hardcore gangster with a, a a sweet nickname. They called him Cookie. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a tough guy. You didn't want to mess with Cookie Caruso. No, no, you did. You did. So I get a call from Pete uh, Caruso. And he says, hey, and he knew about me through uh, Tony and so forth. And he said, uh, it's like a, a scene right out of the Godfather. There, there was a guy by the name of Alex Gambino, who was no, I don't think he was in relation to the New York Gambino, was, may, maybe have been, but he had this uh, uh, a vegetable distribution mark, uh, place in uh, this warehouse house district. And he said, hey, you know where Alex's uh, place is? I said, yeah. He said, come on over here. We want to talk to you. I said, yeah, okay. So I'm not sure what's up, but I throw a recorder on. and. Um, I go over to the place and uh, I walk in and I see this array of people sitting in there. There's Fat Tony, uh, there's Pete Caruso, there's a couple other wise guys. And I see this other guy who I recognize as Carmen Milano, the underboss of the Milano crime family. And he's sitting there not saying anything. And I said, well, what's up, guys? And um, <clears throat> Pete Caruso starts it and he said, listen, we know that you uh, did that heist over at the convention center. I said, yeah. And he said, we know that you got a big truckload of stuff and we figure that it's, uh, you probably got about $50,000 worth of stuff, you know, that you could sell. And I said, ah, I'm not sure what it's worth, but probably not that much, but uh, what do you got in mind? He said, well, he said, this is the way it is. And he's lying, you know. He said, the guy that you uh, worked with at the Teamsters, his name was Shorty, uh, is one of our guys. I said, ah, okay. And he said, the way we figure it, if you make 50000 you owe us half of that. And I said, he said, because Shorty's our guy. Well, this, this is beautiful because I'm being shook down by the, uh, by the mob. <laughs> Perfect. Right. I got it's recorder. all being recorded. Yeah. Said, yeah, I got a recorder on. I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is manna from heaven. So, <clears throat> of course, the recorder's going. 
And I see Carmen Milano over there, and I argue with him, of course. I said, ah, it's not 50,000. I said, I'll be lucky if I can get 20. And he said, bullshit. You know, we, Car he said, we heard all about it. You got high-end stuff. And I said, well, whatever. So he said, you, at this point, Carmen Milano says something. He said, you owe some money. And I said, you're Mr. Milano, aren't you? And he's shocked. He said, how do you know who I am? I said, if you're in the business, I know who you, you should know who you are. Your name's Carmen. He said, that's right. So now I'm talking directly to the underboss, and he's trying to shake me down, you know, for a theft, <clears throat> a big heist. And so <clears throat> he said, uh, you owe us the money. And because I was working undercover and I had to be prepared, I had about 6,000 cash in my pocket. And I thought, oh, man, I'm never going to have an opportunity like this again to make a direct payment that's recorded to the underboss of the L.A. crime family. So I jump on it. So I pull. I said, OK, yeah, you're right. I said, I could probably get about 20,000 of it. I said, I got 6,000. He said, that'll work. So I pulled it out. It's all in hundreds. You know, I look over. Pete Caruso's eyes are about this big, you know, and, and he says, you got that kind of money on you? I said, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, of course I do. You think I'm a chump or something? And so I pay him right on the spot. Yeah. So I pay him right on the spot. Uh, from that point on, I was his guy. And um, so every day I would go to the Seabreeze operation, um, uh, kind of like the Bada Bing Club, and I'd hang out with these guys. And again, I didn't try to portray myself as a wise guy. Uh, I was just a former dope dealer, had a lot of money. And these guys could smell it. And that's why they accepted me. And the quickest, uh, so I way, never... to, quickest way into these guys is, I was going to say, it seems to be tried and true and, and universal in, uh, in getting, a, uh, you know, getting your claws into somebody or cutting into somebody is if you show them that you're an earner, you're, you're going to get a lot of doors open for you because they, they, they view everything in, in green. Yeah, it uh, it really blinds their judgment, you know. So, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, I was in, and so every day I'd go over there and I'd hang out. I'd have some coffee. We talk about women. We talk about money. We talk about old robberies that uh, Pete Caruso would. Uh, uh, he had a great he had a great story. I'll never forget. Uh, if you're looking for a little color, he said uh, <clears throat> a guy by the name of Dominic Sp uh, Spinelli who was uh, part of um, uh, uh, the the old crew in Las Vegas uh, out of Chicago. He wrote, a, he wrote a book, I think. Oh, Dominic did? I think he did. I could be wrong, but I think he wrote a book about uh, some of this stuff. He was a slimy guy. He was a backstabber. Yeah. He tried to sell me a phony diamond. He, he did all kinds of stuff. And by the way, Carmen called me up and he said, hey, I just want to let you know if you're dealing with Dominic, that diamond he's got, he showed you the real one, but he's going to try to swap one out. I said, oh, okay, thanks. So, uh, but Carmen liked me and uh, that created a problem too, uh, because these guys were jealous. Uh, they, you know, they're like little <clears throat> uh, high school teenage girls. I mean, you know, Carmen loved me and, uh, you know, not loved me, but he really liked me. And uh, uh, so we would do uh, uh, stuff together. We would talk, but <clears throat> uh, I remember what, it, you know, it was interesting because uh, you would think that uh, major mafiosa uh, figures uh, would be wouldn't be involved in basically petty crime, but they couldn't pass it up. These guys were, and so the difference between the '90s and what is kind of today, from that point kind of forward, and what was happening, let's say from the '80s going back, where bosses right. would never they'd have five buffers between them and the street. That's right. And uh, and Carmel was a smart guy. I, I think he even went to law school. He was uh, never. Yeah, he was a lawyer. I believe he was a lawyer. lawyer. Yeah. I think, he had a, I think he has a license. I think or, he got disbarred. At one point, he had, yeah, he had one point he had his license, and then I think he got disbarred in Black Book. Yeah. So, I mean, Carmel wasn't a dummy. Uh, but, again, he didn't earn his bones on the street. You know, uh, he got his uh, anointment because of who his father was. And the same with his brother Pete in L.A. So uh, I don't think he was respected as much as 
uh, he thought he was, but, um, uh, you know, guys would talk about him uh, behind his back and so forth. But I'll never forget, to give you an example, um, there was, um, uh, they were always looking for little scams they could pull. And uh, so I'm in, in the uh, Seabreeze one time, and so Pete Caruso starts going on to this, uh, this thing, and he says, uh, listen, uh, this guy that we know is a big, big gambler. He's got a lot of money. He owns uh, several nightclubs in uh, L.A., Whiskey a go go, a couple other places, and he's got this big mansion in Las Vegas, and he comes here and he blows hundreds of thousands of dollars when he comes, and we figure that he's probably got a safe in that house. He's got to have a safe, and the, the house is for sale, and you know you look like a clean cut guy and uh, you got a little background and and uh, we want you to hook up with a real estate agent, and essentially case the place for me. And uh, I said, yeah, sounds like a great idea. We'll see what happens. <clears throat> so I, know, I actually ride with Carmen Milano in the car. I'm recording. He's involved in this, essentially, a, what's going to be a breaking and entering, <laughs> you know, if this thing works out, a burglary. So, <clears throat> which just shocked me. Uh, so uh, basically, I get my instructions. I go to the place. I meet with um, the real estate agent. I get the tour. And I'm looking for all the nooks and crannies. I'm in the cupboards and I'm, uh, you know, down in the closet and I'm looking around. I don't see anything. So uh, basically I came back and had to report that, uh, you know, if he's got a safe in there, I don't know where it is, you know. So they eventually decided not to uh, burglarize the place because they just couldn't figure it out. But that's the kind of stuff they'd get involved in, stolen cars. Uh, I remember one time I... Uh, <clears throat> bought a, uh, a stolen, I think it was like a 25,000 watt uh, big uh, generator uh, from a construction site. And I had to pay Carmen for that. I mean, it was just crazy stuff. So, t so and, take us, uh, how, how, Herm, how many years are you undercover when in January of 97, uh, Fat Herbie Blitzstein is murdered, uh, Tony Spilatro's former, one of his former right hands uh, during the Chicago Las Vegas reign, the hole in the wall gang in the 70s and 80s. They all went to prison. Uh, Herbie did a couple years uh, on the on the bus from that and then came out, kind of reestablished some rackets in Las Vegas, but he wasn't paying any protection to anybody. And in this kind of raid of his rackets, he ends up getting killed. Where, where right. how, how long had you been undercover then? Well, I was undercover right when that was all happening. And uh, but I'm developed... saying, had you been undercover for like two years or a year or oh. how long had you been undercover? Uh, I would say uh, uh, probably about a um, year and a half at that point. Okay. All right. So at that point, you, you said it was kind of like some of your priorities shifted and it was kind of all hands on deck. Let's now tie the Blitzstein murder into anything that we're doing. Right. Well, you know, a couple a couple things happened. Um one of these uh, gangsters, uh, not really gangsters, uh, this guy was a thief that I was dealing with. Uh, when I first went undercover in this, uh, in this investigation, uh, I was meant to be like a stopgap uh, because I had undercover credentials, I had a background, and they really, for a big time operation like this, uh, normally what the Bureau would do is they'd bring an undercover agent uh, from out of town that had no family here and so forth. And he would stay here. And uh, um, as I got involved in this thing, it just kept developing to the point of I couldn't get out and my family lived here. So it became problematic. And so I'd have to clean myself from uh, you know potential surveillance going home. I couldn't go out like a normal person would with their family. Uh, became very um, restrictive. And um, they even got me an apartment uh, that I could go to. And then I had a switch vehicle <clears throat> that I'd come out and I'd jump in that car, clean myself, and eventually come back home. It was crazy. Uh, <clears throat> but this guy, as it happenstance, this guy, Shorty, and a lot of times when you meet these guys, you know, you don't really know who they are. Uh, so uh, this guy lived actually not far from where my real home was. And uh, one day he happened to drive by and he saw me out in the yard with my wife and he just kept going I didn't realize I'd been seen and so he went right back to Carmen Milano 
and Pete Caruso. And he said, you know that guy, Sonny? He says, yeah. You know, I saw him out here at this uh, such and such uh, location. And uh, I'm not sure what's going on with that guy, but maybe he ain't who you guys think he is. And uh, because we had Fat Tony involved there as a informant, we knew right away, you know, about what was happening. So <clears throat> what I did is um, we had to act very quickly. Uh, I called the guy that uh, the agent that was my contact agent. And uh, his name was Carl. And I said, Carl, get out to my house. I, you know, we got a problem. I'll explain it to you. He comes out, what's going on? And I said, listen, this is the situation. I explained it to him. And I said, we have an informant that is going to bring this guy Shorty to my house. We actually instructed another informant who knew Shorty to bring him to the house. And the deal was, you and my wife are married. And you're a big shot attorney. You travel all the time. That was the undercover story that I gave Carmen Milano when I was eventually confronted with it. I said, hey, I met this girl. Her husband's a big shot attorney. He's gone all the time. And, you know, I go over there and I do my thing with her, you know. And he said, yeah, yeah, well, we don't care. You know, you do what you want. But I knew it wouldn't hold water. So they, if you can follow this. Um, so um, I, I, I explained this to my wife as best I can. And uh, now she's involved in this thing, right? So uh, they bring, uh, the informant brings this guy to the door, rings the doorbell, and they're going to ask a question about some property. That was the ruse that they were going to use across the street. And of course, Carl is there with my wife. Carl gives the story, yeah, I'm a big shot attorney. This is my wife, yada, yada, yada. I'm gone all the time. So they buy it. But my fate is sealed. You know, you can imagine uh, if something would happen to me or something would happen uh, to my wife or to my family, uh, you know, FBI HQ uh, would just be a huge career disaster for a lot of people. I mean, you can appreciate you had an undercover agent, uh, you know, they knew where he lived. You didn't pull him out. Uh, so basically, uh, from that point on, I had to create a story where I was down in Florida doing a drug deal and uh, uh, I was about to get indicted. And so I was hiding and uh, down in Florida. And so I called Carmen Milano and I told him, and he said, don't say anymore. I understand. You just, and then he, it was interesting. He kind of cleaned himself up on the phone. He said, Sonny, didn't I tell you never to get involved in drugs? I said, what? Sonny. Didn't I ever tell you not to get involved in drug deals? I said, oh, yeah, that's right, Carmen. Yeah, you told me never to get involved in drug deals. Okay. He said, all right, whatever, I'll see you. So that was the end of my involvement at that point. Uh, so we had to bring in another undercover agent by the name of uh, Charlie uh, Maurer, who uh, also had a Cleveland connection. Uh, he had been in uh, the Youngstown FBI office, and so he knew all the bad guys. And he looked like a, a gangster. I mean, he, he could play the role. Uh, he actually uh, played uh, for the Cleveland Browns at one point. I, he was injured, and, uh, but he, he was a badass. And uh, uh, so Charlie was able to take that and uh, uh, really nurture that case. And uh, after about six more months, we were able to bring it all together. But by that time, uh, there are many other offices that were involved in this. Uh, L.A. obviously was involved. Cleveland, uh, I think New York was. And so, for you know, I remember when this surfaced that I was, uh, I could potentially be compromised. I remember talking to the head of the office who came out to my house and um, he said that uh, he explained to my wife what was going on. And uh, God bless my wife. I got to tell you something. She, she's boss. She, she, they said, well, we're going to move the family. And she says, wait a minute. We've only been here, I don't know, a year or so. This is, you know, we're barely adjusted here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've got my own career. It's separate from my husband's. And um, if you tell him to leave, he's got to go. But I don't work for you. So I'm staying here. Yeah. <laughs> so, they, so the bottom line is they had to rent a place uh, for us to go. And uh, we uh, kind of hid out for until, they, uh, until the case was over. So, so it was explained. Explain that Car Carmen Milano cuts a cooperation deal and then recants it, but 
even after he recants it, he's kicked out of the mob and uh, there's really no reclamating or bringing back uh, or reversing the damage that had been done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Carmen, uh, uh, you know, when they finally did grab uh, Carmen uh, and uh, it was presented to him that I was an undercover FBI agent, uh, it was funny uh, because um, he said, you know, I really looked out for Sonny. You know, I really like that guy. And, uh, you know, he's my friend. I mean, he, he was like he couldn't quite get it through his skull that I was on the other side. And no, uh, that, that there is no Sonny. That Sonny is actually her. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, Sonny made up. And, Sonny doesn't uh, exist. Right. Yeah. And so he had, uh, you know, he had a problem kind of, um, you know, getting that together. Hey, he just didn't quite get it. Uh, but you're right. Uh, eventually he did cooperate and then he took it back and he ended up going to prison. And uh, he, it wasn't a long sentence, but uh, he died shortly thereafter. Uh, so, uh, and that was the end of in Pete Caruso. Uh, he went to prison. Uh, the the guys that whacked uh, Herbie Blitzstein, guy Molinero, he still owes me thirteen hundred dollars when mm -hmm. I was undercover. He uh, went to prison along with his son, um, and um, you know Herbie used to stop in every now and then. He was doing some loan sharking, and uh, again, this guy Pete Caruso was vicious. Uh, you know, he uh, just decided and got these guys on board that. Um, that uh, they should uh, go in and rob Herbie because Herbie's juice with the sh Chicago outfit wasn't as great. Well, he, he, wasn't probably... he wasn't kicking up to them, so he didn't have no, their protection. Wasn't. And That's he right. assumed because he had their protection before that he could use that as some type of get out of jail free card with, with the LA guys. LA guys had checked with the Chicago guys, and at this point, Buffalo was also involved in it. Um, so you had two crime families that wanted a piece of his business. They weren't just, they did their due diligence. The Buffalo guys and the LA guys reached out to Chicago. Chicago said, we have no hold on him anymore. That's right. That's uh, right. And so Herbie was, was a little bit of Herbie's hubris because at, at a point, because he was so close to Tony Spilatro, he was untouchable, but not 10 years later. No, he wasn't. And uh, they're very fickle. You know, it's all about the money. And uh, like you said, Herbie wasn't kicking up, uh, but he did have a profitable business and he was dealing in a lot of gold and jewelry. <clears throat> and uh, so they went in to rob him. And uh, uh, we knew that the robbery was actually going to take place, but we didn't know that they were going to kill him. And, um, and uh, they put a gun to his head and shot him and killed him in his own house. Yep. So... so uh, so that, when that, that, was the end of, that was the end of an era, really. That his murder, even though the Spilatro, uh crew had been disbanded for ten years, it really kind of like that was the final chapter. It was of, that, of that casino Chicago era. It was over. But you know, it was interesting uh, before they whacked Herbie. You know, I'm trying to negotiate myself with uh, the undercover unit at FBI headquarters, and uh, I'm telling them, "Hey, listen." These are basically a bunch of old fat guys. Uh, they talk a lot of shit, but they're not, uh, you know, they do some things here. They do, you know, because they, they were really pushing to have me relocated. You know? So I'm trying to mitigate that. I don't want that to happen. And uh, and they said, uh, well, that's what you say. And uh, you never know about these guys. And I said, believe me, I know these guys. And, uh, of course, about a week later, they whack Herbie. So, <laughs> so I guess I was off the mark on that. So well, uh, thank you, Herm, man. This again, these were two great episodes. You can't make this stuff up. Like you couldn't no. if you if you jumped into a Hollywood screenwriter's room, uh, I don't know if some of the stuff that, that Herm experienced in his undercover work, if you could uh have, have put it on to from pen to page, like uh I say it all the time with my guests. Do you guys live a movie script? Well, if we do uh if we uh, do do a movie script, I want you to write it. Fair Thank enough. you, Herm. So hopefully, fair enough. So we're going to bring Herm back. I'm sure uh, I'm glad it, it took us a long time to get him here. And that's on me. I hadn't asked him, but uh, I felt like these were two, uh, two great uh, experiences and parts of his career that I wanted to emphasize. There's more stuff that we can do. And, and Herm, and not to digress a little too much, I have some other stuff that's uh, 
local Detroit stuff that I think maybe you and I can talk about. I got a gig now at NBC Detroit. So uh, maybe there'll be some stuff for us to do where we can kind of hit two birds with one stone, give it to some mainstream media in Detroit and uh, give it to the OG pod. So, sure. Herm, thank you so much. About it's Happy an holidays. Same and, to you, Scott. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We will talk soon. OG Pod. I'm Scott Bernstein out for Herm Groman and Benny Augusta. This was the story of the LA Mafia takedown. It doesn't, from the horse's mouth, right from the source. Uh, Scott Bernstein, OG Pod. I'm out. Thank you.